Welcome to the Church and Family Life podcast. Today we have Josh Bice with us to discuss pragmatism. Josh is the pastor at Praise Mill Baptist Church in Georgia and also the founder of G3 Ministries, a great friend of ours. And we're here to talk about one of the great dangers to the Church of Jesus Christ, pragmatism. Hope you enjoy the discussion. Jason, we kind of grew up in a in an age of pragmatism in the church. Uh, participated fully in a very pragmatic, you know, way of 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 operating within the church. Uh, promoted it. We're leaders in in such things, and uh, but then uh, we kind of got shocked. And I, for me, it was probably, you know, the theology of the Puritans that really shook me up about the way we were, we were operating in church life, had kind of a seeker-sensitive focus. Um, and then I read a book by David Wells called God in the Wasteland. He, you gave me that book. I yeah, did. Yeah. He published it yeah. in 1994, and it just shook me down. And... Um, so everything changed after that, as a result, and 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 other other things, uh, you know, the confessions and things like that, um, really sort of redirect redirected me. Yeah. So we're we're here with Josh Bice. I think probably pragmatism is a trigger word for Josh Bice. Josh, when <laughs> when you hear what does it trigger when you hear the word pragmatism? Oh man, all sorts of things, <laughs> right? So. I mean, if you think about pragmatism, it's you, you can trace the roots back to all sorts of things like Darwinian thought and secular humanism and all sorts of things. But just in a simple nuts and bolts sort of common, you know, way of looking at pragmatism is in many ways, the church has sort of been gripped by this idea of looking for success or some type of instantaneous response that seems to be or feels successful. Mm -hmm. So whatever works, just do that, right? And and so we've seen this grip the church. And this is not just one denomination. You can go across denominational lines and you can see uh, in many ways, you can just trace this idea of pragmatism working its way throughout all sorts of different evangelical circles. And it's a real tragedy. I think if you were to trace it back, you could say, well, you know, figures like William James or even John Dewey um, really popularized the thought. But if you go back all the way to the Garden of Eden, I believe that you can see the birth of pragmatism right mm -hmm. there. When you have the serpent who is tempting Eve, tempting Eve to do what? Well, to doubt the authority of God's word to doubt that her joy and her sufficiency and her the fullness of of who she was was actually found in God that she needed something else and in many ways i think that that's exactly what we see within the church today and and across evangelical you know circles and denominations i i, I like your working definition a lot do do what works it's very simple and you know, as far as it goes, so far so good, right? Who wants who 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 doesn't want to do what works? Who wants to do what doesn't work? Well, nobody. But then, when you start to peel back the layers, we we're going to have to decide on what standard we're using and who can actually understand what works. And I think what we find is that uh, human beings are lousy judges of these things. You know, and yeah, and you know, and in in modern times, in the twentieth century. I think pragmatism in the church really, really accelerated. And you saw the growth of these, I'm going to just call them models of ministry, right? Uh, Seeker-sensitive, purpose-driven. You know, you have a small group movement. You have the multi-site church. You know, you have— Emerging the, uh, church. Emerging church. Yeah, 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 the emerging church movement. You had this progression, you know, along the line. I, I, my, my view is that much of this really sprung out of the 1950s 
and particularly uh, the rise of the modern youth ministry movement and the growth of the, you know the youth ministry industrial complex where 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 you 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 had you had to so thrill you had to thrill a younger generation uh, in order to evangelize them and then you have uh, you know mega churches you know picking up corporate uh principles you know peter drucker kind of became the hero of of the mega church pastors in the 19 1980s and 1990s um and then you know churches are reading i did reading books uh, like jim collins you know uh you know good to great so the the corporate success model the change agent model just gripped the church and so you ended up with a leader who was who is only going to be able to lead the masses if they were just into constant change, constant excitement. And it's, it was just nothing but pragmatism. Mm. Yeah, no, that's really good. In fact, if you think back, as you stated, just, you know, this idea of this corporate idea, this big box sort of system to put in front of churches so that you can say, well, if you employ these tactics or if you do this, then you're going to be successful. I mean, you can go back to the Southern Baptist Convention in 1954, and their motto that year was a million more in 54. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem was, was that they didn't really, in essence, tell the churches how to get that million more. So they were basically just doing whatever would work mm -hmm. to just fill their churches. And I can remember reading about that and then, and then finding myself standing in a pastor's conference at the Southern Baptist Convention a number of years ago. And I remember sitting there hearing Andy Stanley come out to speak. In fact, I had I had purpose to miss his sermon. Um, I went to, to lunch and, and planned my lunch so that I would not have to listen to him preach. And I came back and they were running behind schedule. And so I heard the last half of the sermon. And I was standing in the doorway of the convention hall, and he was standing on the platform, and he was speaking to pastors, and he was talking about if they would make their church better, then they, speaking about the community, would come and make their church bigger. So, And then he would appeal to Microsoft and Intel and, and all these different corporations and he was saying, if you will make your church better, think about the excellence, the presentation, mm -hmm. all of these pragmatic things, not appealing to Scripture as the authoritative Word of God or the sufficient Word of God, but appealing to the way that corporations you know, achieve success. And if you would adopt that methodology at a local church level, then the community will come and they will make your church bigger. And that's just a tragic way of looking at ministry. Mm -hmm. Amen. I, I, th I think it's, I'm sure this didn't originate with John Piper, but I've heard him say it. Uh, what you win your, uh, what you win people with is what you win them to. And what he means by that is, uh, if you win people with with entertainment and amazingly cool things, you better be prepared to go cooler and cooler and cooler because the original cool normalizes really fast. And if you want them with that, the only way they're going to stay is if you can keep upping the ante. And it leaves you in a position where they're actually not believers who are coming uh, for God. They're people who came for the cool, and now you have to up the ante. And you've got to keep repeating mm -hmm. the innovations. You, you, you've, you've got to, you know, every few months, you've got to refresh the program. You've got to come up with a new, a million more in 54, new programs, new vision statements, you know, new things to stir people up. And I've, I've seen that happen even in the churches around here. The leaders launch these, you know, initiatives. And a lot of them have to do with evangelistic goals and and some good things like that, but uh, but this is pragmatism. It's just one innovation after another in order to try to thrill the masses. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I mean, if if you look at you know the Roman Catholic Church, or if you look at the Evangelical Church, you can see you know churches that are within the realm of orthodoxy using pragmatism, but you can also see cult groups or churches that are outside of you know, the realm of orthodoxy using pragmatism as well. I can remember being in Cologne, Germany, and walking for the very first time into that massive cathedral and walking in, and there was like so many people, I couldn't hardly get in the door. Every nook and cranny of this massive cathedral with all of this architecture, 
was just slammed with with human bodies. I would later find out that it's the most visited tourist attraction, if you will, in all of Europe. And at the front of this massive cathedral is a golden box. And when I went up there and looked there, you know, you can only get so close to it. And, you know, I, I didn't know what this box was. And so then someone standing next to me, I asked them and they said, well, you don't know about this box. And I said, no. And they said, well, in that golden box are the, are the bones of the three wise men who visited Jesus. And so this is a relic of the Roman Catholic church, right? So obviously you can read back throughout church history and you can hear uh, and and hear stories and read stories about the relics that were used to entice people to do their pilgrimage to Rome. Martin Luther did it. But I was standing there in a cathedral, an ancient cathedral, standing there just a few years ago and listening to these people talk about how they had traveled for, you know, days to be able to stand in front of this golden box. And that is a it's a it's a lure of pragmatism to get people to take these you know these pilgrimages and to think that if they do they're going to have some sort of you know closer walk with the lord mm-hmm. uh and we can condemn that you know as we look at the roman catholic church but when we then look a little closer to the evangelical church and then we think about how we too demonstrate a lack of confidence in the sufficient word of god by how we approach ministry it can be a bit you know, convicting. You know, I, I began to think that the evangelical church had become like the Roman church in its pragmatism. In fact, it's funny, that I, I'm, it's interesting that you brought that up because I wrote a book a few years ago, Family Reformation, The Legacy of Sola Scriptura in Calvin's Geneva. But in this book, you know, I argue that the pragmatism in the church really, you know, fomented the pragmatism and the unbiblical practices in the family and the Reformation. So I, I just want to read, I want to read some of this to you here. Um, uh, Calvin uses the word thraldom for the Roman church, you know, people just uh, being th- thrilled by, you know, this innovation and and that innovation. And so, you know, but but the reformers did away with the thraldom of of the Roman Church, and um, so you know you know out went the costly programs like the pilgrimages, um, you know out with the litany, the prayers to the saints, the pilgrimages, the benefices, the indulgences, the sacerdotalism, the altars, the kneeling at communion, the auricular confession, the cult of Mary and the saints, the celebration of holy days and feast days, prayers for the dead, pictures of Christ icons of crosses and crosses out went the belief out out went the belief of purgatory the sign of the cross crucifixes images elaborate ritual surpluses uh, out went the popes the bishops the archbishops the monks the friars the canons <laughs> the canons regular uh, the cathedral dignitaries, the archdeacons the rural deacons the canon lawyers the prebendaries the chaplains okay there's more. I'm not even done. <laughs> but I, the, the the Roman Church became a house of inventions, Absolutely. and evangelical leaders have done the same, and Absolutely. and that was what was so disturbing to me in the mid '90s when I finally started to see these things after not seeing them. So uh, here's the classic text: Second uh, Timothy three sixteen and seventeen. We can't recite it uh, often enough. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So a foundational question is, is that true? If it's Mm. true, then you really are duty-bound to build your life around it being true, which means you... Uh, you adopt the presupposition that every good work, you can be thoroughly equipped for it with the Bible. There's not a single good work that exists that the Bible isn't competent to thoroughly equip you for. If that's true and you build your life around it, uh, you don't need the do what works mentality because you trust that the Bible actually knows what works. 
really works, not not that will fill a sanctuary with as many unbelievers as believers, but will actually uh, wor- worship God in a faithful way and help people make meaningful progress in their faith. I mean, what you just read condemns pragmatism. Uh, let's just ha- let's just hang with the scriptures and let's just talk about what the scriptures say because the scriptures do condemn pragmatism you know and i i can't help but think of judges 21 25 in those days every man did what was right in his own eyes oh my that's always the root of the problem Mm -hmm. but let's let's just let's let's just turn to the to the word of god and and explain how the scriptures speak of pragmatism yeah absolutely brothers i i amen all of that Um, if you look at second timothy 3 16 the the word there uh, God breathed or given by inspiration mm-hmm. of, depending mm-hmm. on the translation, um, is Theonoustos. And when you think about, you know, the fact that all truth finds its source in God. So when we think about the fact that we should have an absolute confidence in God and through His Word that He has given us, that it's the sufficient Word, the authoritative Word, we don't really need to go out to the culture and have the culture to affirm the the trustworthiness or the validity of God's word it is true and then when it comes to gospel ministry a couple of things we need to remember would be you know Paul's words to the church at Corinth in the opening chapter when he says that the Jews seek after signs and the Greeks seek after wisdom but what does he say that he does He and the apostles, they preach Christ crucified, which the world, especially the Greek mind of the day, considered to be utter foolishness. So if we go into churches that have been riddled with pragmatism and we take seriously the preaching and the teaching of God's Word, much like Martin Lloyd-Jones did years ago in his context, then you know what? We may actually have churches that decrease in number and decrease in size. But but that will only be for a short season if the Lord pleases, because then it'll be like the pruning of a bush. It will eventually grow and become more healthy. Amen. And so we need to, to always be mindful that if we take the Word of God seriously, whether it be an evangelism on the streets, whether it be preaching in a, you know some sort of an evangelistic setting, or whether it be on the Lord's Day, and, and taking worship seriously and not being gripped by the inventive principle, just whatever we feel like doing or whatever might work. If we, you know, anchor ourselves in the Word of God, then the numbers do not really dictate whether or not it's true or good or right. It is what God has said in His Word. That's the standard. And, and I think that that's why the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 2.5 uh, he he said that our, our our ministry would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. And it's so dangerous to have a ministry resting on the wisdom of men. And that's really the heart of the problem with pragmatism. What what other what other what other scripture can we bring to bear here? Yeah, I mean, I think just a simple you know verse that comes to mind is in Jesus' words as he's praying in his high priestly prayer in John 17, when he says, sanctify them in truth, for your word is mm-hmm. true, or is truth. And so uh, when we think about the source of truth being God, and then, of course, God has revealed himself to us in his word, his word is profitable for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness— so we don't need a scheme or a tactic or some sort of thing that this world would say is good. Uh, we actually need truth. And that's why it was massively appalling to me to watch the decision of the Southern Baptist Convention back in 2019 when Resolution 9 was placed before the convention floor, and it was on the use of critical race theory and intersectionality as analytical tools for gospel ministry. And this was a convention that had fought over the inerrancy of God's Word for so long. And then people would say, well, how is it that the convention, the SBC, could actually approve or adopt a resolution to use something like critical race theory and intersectionality for analytical tools in gospel ministry. And and I think the answer really is the fact that the SBC has 
has committed or been committed to embracing the inerrancy of God's Word, but not necessarily the sufficiency mm -hmm. of right. God's Word. And the sufficiency is really the battleground issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, a number of times in Deuteronomy and then in the, the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, it, it tells us that we're not to add to or take from the Word of God. And this really is the heart of uh, a, a pragmatic mindset. Pragmatism always gives you less than the Bible or more than the Bible. And what the people of God need is the Bible. Yeah, I mean, Proverbs sixteen twenty five. there's a way that seems right to a man but its end is the way of death. Jeremiah 17, 5, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Uh, Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is enmity, is, en is, a, is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Uh, you know, you have Colossians 2, 8, and the the, the potentiality of being cheated by philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, you know, the basic principles of the world. I think you can apply that mm -hmm. uh, to corporate business practices and psychology and all matters of cultural forces, you know, that are that are at work. But there, there, there are just many places to go in the Bible to wean us from the wisdom of man for the church of Jesus Christ. Maybe the uh, ultimate pragmatist was Charles Finney, uh, mm -hmm. revivalist, uh, more than a more than a century ago, and he said something to the effect that if you gave him uh, fifteen minutes with anyone, he would return to you a convert. Mm -hmm. And so he he developed these finely tuned mechanisms for, uh, you know, uh, uh, creating converts. But the truth was, uh, none of his children ended up walking with the Lord, and so there has to be under underlying realities. We're we're not in a stimulus response universe that uh, that just guarantees an outcome if you just pull the right lever. Actually, there is a God in heaven who honors simple faithfulness. You know, I think this is such a critical matter because what happens in the church begins to happen in the family. What begins to happen in the family begins to happen in the wider culture. And so, you know, pragmatism in the Church of Jesus Christ is one of the most devastating things that can happen in the culture. And I really do believe that a lot of, a lot of the, the really heartbreaking things that we're seeing happening in our culture today, they really go back to the growth of pragmatism in the 20th century. Uh, and that really was started by like William James and John Dewey and and, and those characters. But but let's let's talk about um, the effect on uh, on the church. Uh, you know what happens in the Church of Jesus Christ when you have a pragmatic church? Yeah, I think I think one simple low hanging fruit answer to that would be that number one, you diminish the church's view and confidence in the sufficiency of God's mm -hmm. Word, which we've just mentioned mm -hmm. a moment ago. But I think another thing that you see as a direct result of that way of thinking would be that the church, by and large today, across evangelicalism, is not practicing biblical church discipline. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is because anything that would seem as like counterproductive to growth, and, and that would be or, or, or look like something that would decrease numbers in the life of the church, like church discipline, then that seems to be counterproductive. And so as a result, so many churches have just decided to take Jesus's command to actually engage in biblical church discipline for the purity of the church and set that aside. Hmm. And that's been one of the most discouraging things that I've seen in my own personal ministry across evangelicalism. Amen. And you, and you see that, you know, so you see the impact in society, you know, rolling from that neglect in the church where sin is, sin is not dealt with in a, in a, in a godly manner. So here, yeah. yeah, here's here's another uh, another thing that happens. We start feeling responsible for the results. And we are, we are responsible. We're responsible to do the things that God has called us to do. But res results aren't guaranteed. Um, you know, Noah, 
the uh, New Testament calls him a preacher of righteousness. I mean, he had almost no converts. Does that mean that Noah wasn't doing the right thing? Actually, it doesn't mean that at all. He was uh, he was faithful, but God is is responsible for the results. Uh, a, a church that starts to feel like that we are the ones responsible for the results is a church that starts to compromise in order to get the results. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think you're on to something there. I mean, I, w- I would ask you, brothers, what do you think about this idea of pragmatism having an impact on a diminished view of church membership? And like, in other words, decreasing the the standards of what it means to be a, a member of a local church. I'm, I'm seeing this in a lot of churches today that will just sort of like make just any warm body that just shows up in the life of the church for more than one week in a row um, would be like, you know, if you, if you show up consecutively, maybe one month, then you're, you're a member of the church, but they don't really have a standard of what it means to be a, a biblical church member. And I, I think that this idea of pragmatism has sort of uh, infected the church with a disease in many ways that's, that's diminished a high view of church membership. Well, yeah. And, uh, you know, that kind of person is really saying, um, I want to, I want to involve myself in a church my way, my way. And so I don't need to subject myself to the, for, for the reasonable covenants of church membership because it's my own pragmatism, you know, that's driving my life. And, and that's sort of the, the tragedy of pragmatism in a church. It creates, you know, believers who are just kind of nomadic. They're always looking for the next best gig, you know, in the church. And so they don't, and they really don't want to become members because they might find something better, you know, in a few weeks or next year or something like that. So they don't want to covenant with people and actually have a stable kind of life in a local church and really build up that local church. I think pragmatism just diminishes the authority of Jesus Christ in the church. It's it's kind of simple in that mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think both of us could speak to the idea of the importance of conferences and events because we're both engaged in that sphere, that circle. However, we major on, you know, the ministry that you're involved with, church and family life, and then G3 ministries, we major on the local church, mm-hmm. right? Um, but but when you look at pragmatism and the way that pragmatism is sort of infecting a lot of churches, and and by churches, I'm not just speaking of like, you know, just the campus, I'm talking about the way in which the body functions, the actual people of that of that local church. And you're seeing that there's just a lot of people that are just not really satisfied with the ordinary means mm-hmm. of grace. The ordinary means of grace is not enough. We need something extraordinary. Mm-hmm. And so they're constantly looking for the next event. Mm-hmm. And I encourage people, go to events, go to conferences, enjoy. You know, if it's a vacation type of thing or if you're afforded multiple weeks a year, do that. It's It can be a wonderful, spiritually beneficial thing for you and your family. But you have to come back home with this idea of, I am, I am newly committed in a, in, in a way to my local church. I see the importance of the local church. Like I need the ordinary means of grace in the context of that local church's mm-hmm. worship service on the Lord's day. It's not something that's just like, you know, a, a buffet and I might need it or I might not need it. it just depends on the appetite of the hour. Mm-hmm. No, we actually need the ordinary means of grace. And it's through that ordinary consistent worship and approach to God on the Lord's day that we actually do grow. And it's a good thing. Yeah. And I think that's why in, in your conferences and our conferences, we love to gather people together and rejoice and teach, but we always do the same thing. We send people back to their local church. Uh, a conference is not a local church. <laughs> and it's, uh, and so we just so pray for the prosperity of local churches, and I really appreciate Josh your your whole work and ministry toward that. Uh, it's it's what we, it's the need of the hour. Yeah, Amen. You guys as well. Yeah, we've got to strengthen local churches, and that's what we exist for. You know, it'd be a wonderful thing. I've said it before. If you know G three ministries could come to a place where it wasn't needed anymore, 
you know, and we could just shut the ministry down and local churches are healthy and strong. But that's not really the case. And and even within the strong and healthy churches, there's still a need for good resources and events and the sharpening of believers, the education, the encouragement of believers. But but in many ways, G3 was started because of the lack of health and strength mm-hmm. of local churches. Right. And I know that you have a, a similar vision. Mm-hmm. And I just I just pray that that the church can see that, you know, that pragmatism is in many ways, it's like a drug. Mm-hmm. It entices us to think that we're going to have instantaneous joy or mm-hmm. some some type of greater delight in God if we just do it this way. And it's just, it's just not true. Yeah. And it creates nomadic church people, which is, which is really a harmful thing. Well, Josh, thank you so much for joining us on, on our podcast. Uh, it's always, a, always a blessing. Uh, my privilege to be with you, men. God bless Amen. you. Amen. And thank you for joining us on the Church and Family Life podcast, and we hope you can join us next time. Church and Family Life is proclaiming the sufficiency of Scripture by helping build strong families and strong churches. If you found this resource helpful, we encourage you to check out churchandfamilylife.com.